hello and welcome to our podcast, The Family of Things. And in this week, I'm talking to a poet and author, Nessa O'Mahony. And Nessa, you've joined us today to talk not just about your own poetry, but a little bit about your life and your journey so far. And in this podcast, we're curious not just about what people do, but how they've become who they are. Nessa, as a poet, where did it start? Can you remember the first poem you read and when you decided you might write one? Um, I can remember poems that we learnt for recital. My mother was a speech and drama teacher and we did a lot of the Guildhall exams as, as quite young children, like six, seven. Can you remember when you, what, what your first poem was? Yes, I can. And somebody actually recently threatened to post it on Facebook because it was actually in the school magazine. And I... Remember that the first line went something along, life is no garden path. So at the age of 13, I was clearly already very philosophical about things. But that was published in the school magazine and that was very exciting to have it. I didn't keep it. I have no idea what happened to it. When did you start to write more fully? When I was 30, actually. I went to university in the meantime. I studied literature. I studied writers who seemed to be uniformly dead and male. There wasn't any suggestion in the early 80s that literature or writing was produced by people who were actually living and breathing and around me. And then coming up to that sort of fairly uh, important birthday, my mother said to me, we've been thinking about what we'd like to give you as as a birthday present. And we thought a creative writing course. And I'm kind of going, are you mad? Why would I want to do a creative writing course? And she just thought that there was something missing that I couldn't see and that that was a desire to write and express my own ideas, my own thoughts. So, you know, thinking, well, maybe I might learn how to write the great Irish novel and uh, join the ranks of the people I had studied in university. I, I did this creative writing course. It was one of these sort of multifaceted courses where you tried a bit of everything and the uh, evening that we were asked to go and write a poem, I went home and found myself writing about an aunt who had died maybe four years beforehand. She had been my godmother. And the experience of writing about this person was unlike anything that I'd ever written. You know, I'd written press releases on the insurance industry. I had had written technical articles about banking. I had never had the experience of being aware on one level that there was something that I wanted to very carefully craft, but feeling this incredible emotional charge because this was my own territory, the people I cared about, things that I had been noticing in life that, you know, it was important for me to to get right. And this first poem that I, I wrote for that exercise, I found myself writing about an aunt who had died, as it happens, five years to the date that I wrote the poem. I didn't realize that. At the time that I was writing it, though, though, saw that afterwards. And so I'm writing the poem, I'm making the word choices, but I'm also crying as I'm typing and thinking, this is really interesting and strange and, and, and something I've never really had that kind of reaction to as a writer. And I guess that's what caught me. So the poem is called The Carer, and it was in my first collection. After, when we've shaken off the clay... Though chill remained to spite the late spring day, I climbed once more the steep and narrow stairs to your room. Perfume proudly displayed, unopened, a gift from the niece in London. ABBA records, I never heard you play. Your picture of Padre Pio and dolls, stiff-backed and glassy-eyed, dressed in costume of countries you never got to see never expected to. A layer of dust, the only sign of absence. Personal effects laid out under the gaze of mourners. And I guess what was happening from there on was that you were finding your own voice because this idea of dealing with memory and family and the emotional ties that bind us, in a sense, what I've called this podcast, The Family of Things, this, this line from the Mary Oliver poem, Wild Geese, this idea that we are connected, then in a sense, what seems in reading your poetry it started was a journey about personal navigation, your family, memory, past, and essentially finding yourself within that. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely true. And I'm quite embarrassed by this first poem sometimes because I realise how judgmental it was in retrospect. I really had no idea 
what my aunt's life as a single woman looking after my grandmother, surrounding herself by all these objects that were very precious. And I feel like I'm judging her. I think I'm realising, because I was a single woman at the time, that I'm possibly terrified of sharing her fate. So there's, a, there's an element of, well, if I identify that in other people, I won't fall into the same pitfall myself. So I'm seeing connections. I'm wanting to capture the people around me, but I think I'm also seeing resonances everywhere in my own experience, which makes it sound a lot more egocentric than I think I want to sound like. But I suppose that's what was going on. There is that very frank honesty about what you have been doing as a poet over this last 20 years, because, you know, in a sense, it is now 20 odd years since you, since you wrote that poem. One of the things in looking at some of your recent work as well is that you, you've been very open to dealing with failure, the inability to write, the questions about whether you are a good poet or not, loneliness, love, absence, and as you say, that, that, that hunger to be a couple, that, that search for love, which is very much there in your work when, when you look at the insight of home. Hmm. Is that something that you found cathartic or challenging to be so revealing in public? I don't know how you couldn't be, I suppose, And, you know, maybe other writers have navigated those boundaries more skillfully than I have. I just simply don't have that censorship. And it's funny because I worked for a long time in public relations and I learnt the skills of how you reveal truth and how you hold back truth. I can do that professionally. I can't do it with myself in my own writing and have found it harder and harder as the years have gone by to even do it professionally. So I'd be a lousy PR person now because I'd keep on saying, no, that, you know, that's a crap product. But in my poetry, if it isn't truthful, there's absolutely no point in writing it. Even if it does expose you to, you know, pity or derision or... There are other people who are experiencing the same sort of confusions and uncertainties and, you know, they'll get it. So... How did your family react to you basically, not just creative writing and writing fiction, but writing about them as well? They were fantastic. My mother in particular, who is still one of my most encouraging supporters and avid readers and has put up with a lot. I think in in the latest book, I have a poem about her on the brink of the grave. And she listened to me reading this with with great equanimity. Um, I have an early poem about, about, you know, noticing her wrinkles for the first time. I think she understands why I'm doing it, as did my father. There was one poem in not, it's actually ended up in this latest book. It was nearly in a previous book. and, And my father read it and felt... No, don't publish that. It makes me look gaga. And I'm saying, but dad, it's written with love. It's written with love. But he didn't want it. So I would never push that point. So it it, it wasn't published until, you know, four years after his death. And I suppose your father's shadow is across a lot of your work since his death. And like for all of us, the loss of our parents, and I think particularly for women, the loss of your father is a seismic shift in our identity and our sense of who we are. So Donald, your dad, is a big character that we we come across a lot. But share the poem you're talking about. It's called Giving Me Away. Because you never walked me down the aisle, you sit 330 miles in the passenger seat, watching the speed dial, miming brakes when the arrow climbs too high for your liking. Britain speeds by an AA list of pubs and service stations. Place names striking chords, fueling small talk about battle sites and pit stops. We stop at a little chef, debate if one of us should wait to mind the car's contents. I let you win this time. By Birmingham, I realise we've never spent so long in each other's company, which might explain why you don't always reply seem lost in maps, worried by junction numbers. Ask me to repeat myself so often that I snap my irritation back at you. On we drive, each mile a little closer to my new start, my resolve lasting until you ask me for the umpteenth what it is that I just said. And I know you've already left me on this trip, at Hollyhead, 
at Dublin port before the ship embarked. And essentially that, that is from a trip, a road trip that he and I did when I, in 2002, I went to the University of East Anglia and drove. I wanted to bring my car over. So Pops insisted that he would come with me. His little girl couldn't make that journey on her own. And it was the first time I realised that he was actually going deaf. We hadn't spent eight or nine hours because that was the length of the journey all the way over uh, to Norwich. We'd certainly not spent that length of time in a confined space in each other's company in a very, very long time. So it was obviously a sort of a sign of, of mortality, I suppose. He hadn't fallen ill at that point. It was another four years or so before be he became seriously ill. But I guess it was the first point, like seeing my mother's wrinkles for the first time and that sense of the journey, you know, at, at the late age of 39, leaving home, really. So all of that is in there, I think. And that journey to Wales and everything that flows from it, including love, yes. is very much the story of In Sight of Home. And In Sight of Home, this collection is very different. You would describe it as not just a collection of poetry, but prose poetry. It's a verse novel, really. I think what I was trying to do um, was to actually have a narrative that was carried by poetry, but realising that there were also sort of prose elements that were needed because it was drawn from an actual archive of letters housed in the National Library sent by an Irish woman called Margaret Butler who emigrated to Australia in the 1850s with her, her nine brothers and sisters. And for about 50 years, she was sending these letters home to the cousins, principally one cousin called Forrestal, who seemed to live in the Ballyogan, the Waterford, Kilkenny area. She didn't like Australia. She was miserable. She constantly thought about home and what the relations might be doing at any given time. And even though I was not that far away, I was living 66 nautical miles in, in, in Wales at the time that I, I wrote this, quite happily on a lot of levels, I thought I understood that sense of displacement in a way, and, and that was one of the things that intrigued me. So I wanted to, to capture a form that would you know, use those letters and make use of those letters and be true to the form, but also give me the freedom as a poet to express myself in the sort of the short poetic lines. So it's a combination of, it's a, it's a collage, I suppose. There are letters, there are poems, there are different voices, there are different shapes for the different voices. There are even little post-it notes in the side. You know, it's, it's very postmodern. It is. I mean, and it's it's quite a journey. In some ways, there's a cinema feel to it because you do feel at times you're in this movie with, with Margaret and Forrestal in Australia and then you're pulled back to what is in some ways your own parallel story with this diary of Fiona mm. Sheehan. So it's interesting because you chose to have three voices in it, three female voices. And in, in a sense, the middle class woman, Margaret, who, as you say, this unhappy, sad creature, really, who slaves her life away in Australia and never really seems to find that fulfilment, except maybe you give it to her a little bit in the end. We're never quite sure what is true and not true because you say from the beginning you've mixed the reality of the letters with an imagined life. And then you have a much more humble story of an orphan girl who becomes the servant of Margaret, who in many ways, for me, is the more compelling voice. And then there's somebody who's closer to your own voice, this diary of Fiona, who's the frustrated writer, who's challenging or everything about herself. Like, is she a writer? Is she not? She's single. She's she's unhappy. She has this friend she's jealous of, Roisin in New York, and all those challenges of almost the midlife crisis. And I suppose what, what you're curious about when you read it is, where is your voice? And, and why did you feel the need to create Fiona? When in some ways, when you read through it, and know your own narrative, you think, is this not Nessa? Well, I'm not sure whether I would have had that objectivity. I think I wanted to create characters that might express things that I wasn't prepared to express in my own voice. And I think I always say that Fiona is not me. Fiona obviously had a much better sex life than I ever had, uh, is a lot more ballsy, is a lot more prepared to kind of fight her own corner than I would be. So I'm definitely vicariously experiencing things through her. She does have a love story. I had embarked on a love story at the same time, but it was a very different type of love story. So I guess I'm playing with 
alternative realities that might be somewhat similar to what's happening, but are quite different. Nobody likes Margaret much, God love her. And, and, and I feel sorry about that because I think she was a, the real Margaret in the, in the letters. And I definitely tried to capture the honesty and the, the bravery of that voice. She made the best of a tough life. Lizzie is completely invented. Lizzie is the workhouse orphan. And I'd actually read, I'd edited a book for a friend, a woman called Nellie O'Cleary, who had written a book a few years uh, before about various documentary sources of women giving direct testimony about their experiences. And she had a piece about a workhouse orphan. So I based Lizzie on her. I like her too. I like her enormously. She, I wanted her as a foil for Margaret because I thought Margaret needed to be challenged. But also there were plot devices. I wanted to have a kind of a love story thing going on in parallel. And poor Margaret was never going to do it because she had left Forrest Hill behind her. So Lizzie has a, a little intrigue with Margaret's younger brother. But she gets punished in the end for that one. Yeah, I mean, women don't really come out very well from inside of home. It is a journey, but, you know, you kill off Lizzie. Yes, I do. <laughs> Margaret gets to have Lizzie's child to bring up, which seems her only fulfilment in, in this empty shell-like life she leads in Australia. And it's never quite clear whether Fiona has reconciled or, or that she moves on happily. Like, there's a conflict there where she doesn't want to give up her independence. Yeah. And, so, and I think we have those thoughts in our lives, you know, when we're in relationships, was there an alternative? When we're not in relationships, wouldn't that be the better alternative? I think most of us spend a certain amount of time wondering about the road not taken. I think it's also worth mentioning that there's very funny moments in Insight of Home, that your poetry is not just about the dreary and the dead, in a sense, in looking back at memory as sadness, or the, the, that there's a lot of funny elements within it, particularly the relationships between Fiona and Roisin. And I was going to suggest maybe that you might pick out something which captures that. The, f the friend Roisin is essentially the source of the letters. It's actually Roisin's relation who has the house clearance and the letters are found and, and she gives them to Fiona because she knows Fiona is a, a writer in search of a subject and she doesn't really know what to do with them th themselves. So this is, this is from their meeting up. She's, she sent her an email and, and they're meeting up. And it is actually based on an old college friend of mine, but I'm not going to tell you who that was. I'd have known her anywhere. It might have been 10 years, but that Isabella Rossellini Bob, babushka doll cheeks and startled blue eyes were unmistakable. Beautiful skin, which moisturiser. And gravity hadn't begun to play the tricks it pestered me with. She had a prosperous air, wore silk, amber in great chunks at her neck, chew shoes, naturally. We drove to Kilkenny in her car, a rental with more vavavoom than mine, CD player belting out Coltrane along the N9. She talked of marriages gone wrong, of New York life, and whether I knew what had happened to other college pals. Flashback to 91. She'd called over once, broken-hearted from the latest escapade, and spent the whole day playing Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You, over and over till I thought my mother's cassette deck would melt. It's been seven hours and 15 days. Not quite that long in my case, and I hadn't been playing tapes. So I decided to wait a while before telling her about my latest fiasco. I think what's interesting about Inside a Home is also that idea of wondering whether you are a poet or whether you are a writer. And... There's that scene where you're at a family gathering. It's Christmas, I <laughs> yeah, think. Yeah, I know. And it's so painful. <laughs> it is so recognisable. And when your sister-in-law, and again, you don't have that many sister-in-laws. <laughs> when your sister-in-law talks about trying to make conversation about something on the Pat Kenny show and there's a new collection of poetry and everyone's in it. And are you? And there's this, this silence that opens up. Do you have that? Poem, I do. Or do. You know, it obviously is coming from a real event in your life. Well, one sadly, one of many. I mean, you know, I think 
it's a, a, something that a lot of writers recognise, this, this whole thing around anthologies and who's in and who's not. And, and everybody can't be in everything. And yet it's the sort of the visible sort of criterion as to whether you've made the grade or not. And particularly if it's an anthology that actually gets mentioned on the, the national airwaves, that doesn't happen very often. So, yeah, I think I, I probably uh, played for laughs, something that was a great source of personal trauma. No, I think we recognise that people sometimes don't know what to say to writers when they're not writers themselves, so they cast for any subject and something happens to be about a book and they hope that you're in it and you're not. I arrived to a full house crammed to the brim with forced smiles, children rushing round, glucose charged from room to room, adults surreptitiously checking their watches, the marrieds, that is. We spinsters knew we were there for the long haul, nobody to go home to, after all. So time could suspend itself, go backwards, Scrooge-like, though Christmas pasts were just the same as this one, the same vow that next year would be different. The kitchen full, I drifted to the living room where a sister-in-law eyed me warily, not quite sure what note to strike with the writer in the family. Small talk exhausted, she turned to poetry. There's a new book out, she said brightly. I heard it on the Pat Kenny show. Everyone's in it, are you? <sighs> Terrific. I'd hoped the latest oversight would go unnoticed. They don't usually give a toss about my scribblings. I'm not in that one. Just an editor who doesn't know her arts from her elbow. I laughed convincingly. Did I imagine that the room went quiet? Did several pairs of eyes look away? Christmas makes you paranoid. It feels so painful even to hear you read that because there's a sense in which being public as a poet is not an easy place and very few people end up in this Seamus Heaney echelon where you are the national hero. And I think that's interesting in so much of your work that, that, that you're playing with that, that as you say, it took you a very long time to have the courage to use your voice. You're 30 before you start writing in any public way. And it does mean that you're continually sort of saying, am I wasting my time? Mm, mm -hmm. And I think I really need to learn the life lesson will be not to look for a validation from outside because you're never going to get it. There's never going to be the satisfaction of all of those pats in the back. And yet you continue to have the need to write. You know, I think sometimes I wish I could sort of have that initial excitement back of those first couple of years of starting to write when it, I hadn't been published. It wasn't about, you know, what books would come out, how people might read them, how I'd be received. It was just the joy of finding that voice and obviously you are a teacher as well. You teach creative writing. Has that journey of trying to inspire, to mentor someone else also changed the way you think about your writing? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think I have a sort of a dogged approach to how I write. It's not clear to me that it has changed much through writing, which I or through teaching rather, which... I enjoy en enormously. I attempt not to sound worldly wise and disenchanted when I go into a room with a, a new bunch of writers because the chances are there's somebody there that's going to do amazing things and, and, and blow the rest of us out of the room and that will be fantastic if that happens. I'll hate them. We, we've made work with Van Bolin and she always says, forget this idea of inspiration or muses, or all of this. She says, I get up every day and I go to work. She's and very I write, wise. I write, write every day. How do you write? She's absolutely wise. I can actually say for the first time in a long time that yes, I do write every day because I have started a novel. And it's really interesting that, you know, somebody says to me, okay, write 500 words of a novel every day and you'll have a novel in 26 weeks. And I go, okay, I will. I've never written poetry every day in my life. I wish I had. And Ivan Boland is absolutely right. Uh, but do what she says, not what I do. <laughs> now, I'm going to, in a sense, talk about, go back to Her Father's Daughter, your latest work. And I suppose, again, to talk about your dad and your grandfather and a sense that in many ways you, you have that personal documentary 
aspect to it, which Yvonne Boland also has in terms of her grandmother and the stories in her family. And I suppose with her, it became this this push to put women's history back into the public arena through her poetry. On your line here, it's the male stories which have created the arc of her father's daughter. Well, I think certainly a generation of Irish men in the first quarter of the 20th century lived extraordinary lives and never spoke about it. My grandfather, who's on the cover of the book and, and there is a section of poems about him in it, fought in World War I. He was uh, joined up in 1915 and he was with the Royal Munster Fusiliers. He was invalided out in 1917 and promptly joined the IRA to fight against king and country, I guess, and was active in the northeast of England and was actually arrested having shot a policeman in the ear. He didn't kill him, I've been told, but he did wound him in the ear. And Grandad was sent to Parkhurst Prison, where he spent about a year, and then he was amnestied out along with the others when the treaty was agreed. And then, as you know, we descended into civil war and Grandad had joined the Free State Army. So he's in that, you know, the next major conflict, the civil war for another two years or so. But he never spoke about any of this. His, his family, and he had 10 children, none of them were told directly by him any of his experiences, either on the battlefields in the Somme, there were some stories about the Civil War and mum would tell me how every year they'd go to Mayo on their summer holidays and they'd go to Glore outside uh, Kiltamont looking for Grandad's toe, which had been shot off in this ambush. And so they kept going back to see whether they'd find it on this particular occasion. But mostly he kept very quiet and the stories that came down came through his wife, my grandmother, and to my mother and then to me. So I had written about it before. There's a, a section in my second collection, Trapping a Ghost, which is an imaginary historical narrative based on my grandparents' Civil War love story, which is another story entirely. So I had been, um, I suppose, imaginatively engaging with that story, but I had also begun to do a, a more serious piece of family genealogical research into Grandad and found out a lot more about the World War I experiences, found this photograph, which nobody in on my side of the family had ever actually seen of Grandad in his Royal Munster Fusilier uniform, and realised that, you know, his story was one that needed to be told because, A, it was representative of a lot of other Irish men, but it would be lost. And I wanted to tell it, but me being this mulish, obstinate poet... I wanted to try and tell it through poetry because that felt like the, the realist expression for me. So that's, as I said, this sort of one, of the, one of the sections in the book. And in some ways, again, the strongest images, I would think, from the collection are when it connects to your life now and the resonances from your grandmother. So in some ways, ironically, while, as I say, it's, it's like a male arc, your father and, and your grandfather's stories, they're told through your grandmother, to your mother, to you. So you still have a sense that this is very much a matriarchal storytelling line. And there's one poem I'm going to ask you to read, which comes back into the modern, which is Doorways. Doorways. Your first shot, me framed in the door of my grandmother's house in Garbally. Our first stay. And it feels strange when I'm trusted with the key with instructions on how to keep the fire lit. You mention Granny's house, and it sounds alien on your lips. She was dead years before I met you. But she always predicted the old sock would find the old shoe eventually. So this idea of the, the old sock would find the old shoe eventually, this comes to, I suppose, how you met your husband. Yes, I think there were a lot of things going on there because it was our first trip away together as a couple and we came and stayed in my grandmother's house in Ballinasloe and Peter was just using the term granny incredibly easily, which surprised me because I felt, well, they hadn't been introduced. I hadn't talked about his granny at all. But then the sort of sense that, that you know, I suppose her sense for her grandchildren and she, she never lived to see any of them married, 
any of the girls that is married, was that, ah, well, for every old sock, there's a no shoe, was her phrase. And there's someone for everyone. Which and is I suppose that, that, that had pro- probably sustained me all my life. You know, I did meet Peter at a time when I was feeling incredibly happy with my life. Very satisfied living in Wales. I had started my PhD. I was writing poetry. My life was around writing poetry, going for wonderful walks, solitary in a way, but 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 extremely happy about it. And then I went and I did a, a workshop in Tinuad, which is a lovely space, a residential writing centre in North Wales. Peter Salisbury had signed up for it too. And we met and there was just this sort of sense of comfort of somebody that I felt extremely comfortable with you know he'd say it himself I'm sure and I hope he'd agree that it wasn't about sparks and it was about a sort of a recognition of oh yes indeed and so we just started to see each other and and continue to see each other after that it didn't feel like a transformation it just felt like a kind of a a very natural next step it didn't seem shocking at all and that granny was right (laughs) granny was always right And you've mentioned now that you're writing a novel. It's interesting because there's a small group of people who are poets and novelists. They're not the majority. It's very much a minor group of people who can cross successfully between both for whatever reasons. Why the novel and why not more poetry? I've said I'm writing a novel. It feels like I'm typing a novel at the moment. Whether I actually do successfully manage that transition from poetry to novel, I'm not sure. I know a lot of my poetry has been very story-based, very narrative-based, and I know I, you know, one of the greatest uh, pleasures I got from people's reactions to In Sight of Home was when they said, do you know it was a page-turner? I didn't want to stop it, I didn't want to put it down, and I thought, yes, I like that. So it would be great to be able to to try and produce a novel that was also engaging as something to read. I have no idea whether I'm going to be able to do it, but I will certainly give it a good try. What inspires you? History is a constant source of inspiration and, and family history, as you've said. You know, the sense of not letting things be forgotten. I think we are getting more and more ephemeral in life now. I think, you know, social media technology is shortening our memory spans, our concentration spans. I can't see that as a good thing. Other writers, who inspires you in other writing? I am a huge fan of Louise Gluck, the American poet. Her nature poetry, her flower poetry in particular. I was thinking this morning about why I seem to spend a lot of time writing about my garden and remembered Marianne Moore's comment about, you know, she says it's real gardens, imaginary toads. So, you know, that desire to document what's real and actual, but find some way of lifting off. Um, I'm not sure if I usually succeed in the lift off, but I enjoy the attempt to mark that line in the sand, capture that kind of environment that I live in. In terms of poetry, there is a sense in which, for many poets, the struggle is to have their voice heard. And you've joked about, I suppose, how few people buy poetry. As a poet, make the case for it. Why should people read or hear poetry? It's a truism, I suppose, that poetry offers consolation in a way that other things don't. So, you know, when somebody dies or, you know, if we want to celebrate, people might reach for the familiar poem. I'm absolutely fine with that. If it's, you know, the the five poems that most of us can remember from our, our leaving search, it's still something that allows us to celebrate and commemorate in a way that a short story never could. So I think we don't tend to read books, books of poems, which means that we never really get a full, full sense of how an individual poet develops over a period of time. In this collection, you use the title Surprised by Joy. You make that connection back to one of the poems most of us read in Soundings in The Leaving Cert and carry with us. What poems do you carry with you? Well, Wordsworth's poem, Surprised by Joy, is probably one of the only ones that I can recite nearly in its entirety. 
surprised by joy, impatient as the wind, I turned to share the transport. I don't remember my own poems, so I really don't know why that one lodged in my head. Let's say it's 40 years later from the time that, that I first read that poem. There was just something about that sense of, of the ability to capture joyousness and stay alive even at the, the depth of sorrow. It was just, you know, and, and God knows when I first read it, I didn't have any sort of sense of, of loss or sorrow there, but there was just something about that quality of resilience, I suppose. And I have found that very important to me throughout my life. So when I wrote this one, I wanted to echo that. Surprised by joy, ambushed by sunlight and birdsong. A moment's work, the time it took to connect a call, hear a flat tone. Hair's breath between light and shade, what we hold, what we give away or have taken from us. And if we retrieve, can we hold cleanly a child's faith that the sun will always rise, the blackbirds sing? One of the things around your work, and indeed all poetry, is that it helps us navigate tragedy and loss. You talked about that first poem you, you wrote in terms of your aunt's life with tears, as you wrote, that there is a cathartic sense of how we use it to deal with trauma and also happiness. Your father's death, really, to come back to that, seems to have been a very deep wound for you. And it's, in terms of your work so far, probably the one that you are referencing continually, the shadow of Donal. Mm. I think possibly because it was a long, drawn-out experience for him, for us. He fell ill in 2006 and never really recovered from that, though it was 2010 when he died. So there were a lot of, of sort of uh, emergency trips to hospital. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's during this, this period as well. So life was just really tough for him. And it was very hard for all of us, not just me, everybody in the family to sort of watch this and feel powerless that we could, you know, do anything other than be the people to drive him to his hospital appointments or, you know, help pick him up or, or whatever we, we needed to do. And I felt quite guilty for the longest time that I would write about it at all because I, you know, felt that, no, this was not material that was suitable for writing about. And, you know, I had in the past been critical of other poets who seemed to sort of have the sang froid to be able to sort of sit by their parents' deathbed and capture that in, in verse. So there's a poem in the collection that sort of explicitly addresses that because I realise that that's what you have to do as a writer. It is your survival to capture what is happening in the written word. So yes, catharsis, but it's, it's your way of coping. Do you want to share that one with us? So there's a reference to, it's actually James Simmons, who I, I also have a poem in, in his memory, the, the Ulster poet. And in an earlier book, I had published a poem where I was quite sniffy about a portrait he had done of his mother on her, on her deathbed. I, I just simply didn't understand. So this is what this is about, really. It's called Portrait of the Artist's Father. Years ago, when I was young and hadn't lost anyone, I wrote about a sketch a poet made of his dying mother. My words were cool, disapproving, those tidy cold strokes of the dead. Now, what else can I do as I sit and watch you sleep one of your countless dress rehearsals? Eyes shut but darting constantly, lids pulsing with each twitch as you fight the demon of the hour. I trawl for metaphors, imagine corollaries for the fluid filling your lungs, some dark assailant emerging from the shade, hands flexed. Your mouth works wordlessly, offers no clues. You may be reading from another script, borrowed perhaps from the novel you've taken weeks to read. My page has been empty for months. Forgive me for filling it. There's maybe a couple of things just in conclusion there. 
which I'm curious about. And I suppose one comes from that, which is to ask you what you might own up to as your greatest disappointment. My greatest disappointment is my ability to be disappointed. I am sadly ashamed that I have taken criticism as badly as I do, that it matters to me. I wish I could be lofty and never read reviews. It's partly that, do you think it's this journey of moving into confidence as a poet, which starts with this 30-year-old writing? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to move into confidence sometime. I don't know if it will ever happen. And to say, a plague in all your houses, I just do what I do and, and I don't really care whether you like it or don't. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe maybe I'm, I'm sort of striving for that Jenny Joseph lady in her 70s wearing purple. I, it might take me to my 90s to get to that particular uh, insouciance, but... Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I like that notion of the journey of confidence. I'm just not very confident that I will achieve that. Going from that, maybe share with us what you would own up to as your greatest achievement. What are you proudest of? Gosh, I don't know. That's, 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 I've never really thought about. Um, I'm thrilled when somebody who isn't related to me says that they've enjoyed the book or somebody that I haven't met before who is therefore not sort of duty-bound to say polite things to me actually seems to have enjoyed something I've done. That, that always amazes me and, and pleases me enormously, and I should probably not confess to that at all. But to be able to just have done something that actually meant something to somebody else is, is an extraordinary thing. And yes, I suppose that's the thing I'm most proud of. But often it's the fact that maybe there is one piece that privately we all feel, that's where I got it. Even if other people don't realise that's where I got it, I know that that's where my proudest piece of work is. Is there a poem? Is there a sense in which you think, I look at that and I know that that one shines? No, there isn't. There isn't at all. You never have that sense? No. Maybe the next one. Even when you read aloud there, you don't have a sense that it's beautiful or it works do you still feel that sense that you're waiting for somebody to say, well done, Nessa, or the kind of the, the, that sort of quality of silence that you'll get from an audience sometime when you really realise that they are listening intently and not just shifting buttocks on their seats. But I need that reflection back. Sad, isn't it? It's honest. In a sense, do you think women, is, that, is there a sense in which a male poet would be so lacking in a sense of security of their own voice? I don't know. I really don't know. I think everybody is different. And there are people who have enormous sort of wells of self-belief, surprising wells of self-belief sometimes. And then there are others who don't. So I, I don't think it's a gender thing. I think it's, it varies from person to person. I think there has been a sea change in terms of, if you think about Ivan Bolin talking about, you know, the fact that breastfeeding was not an appropriate subject for writing in the 1970s. Like, nobody's having those conversations about, you know, it's, is there anything that's not appropriate anymore? I don't think so. For you, is there anything? Deliberately hurting anybody. That would be my boundary. Because I can't conceive of a situation where I'd need to write something myself that would deliberately hurt any, anybody else. You know, I don't see the need for that in my poetry, um, you know, unless there happens to be a character that I'm creating who has nasty thoughts about people. But Like Margaret. Like Margaret. Like <laughs> Margaret, or Fiona at her, at her best. You know, we're all frail, suffering humans at the end of it, and, and, and you know, why would you deliberately inflict any additional pain on anybody if you didn't have to? You don't have to write a poem. You don't. Nessa O'Mahony, thank you very much for sharing your poetry and your life journey and we look forward to reading and hearing the next phase. Thank you. 